So hello and welcome everyone back to our iSpy360 webinar series. My name is Frederick and I am your host for today's Future Friday session where we're going to be looking at cities of the future. Now today I am joined by Saskia Sassen, who is a Robert S. Lind Professor of Sociology and former chair on the Committee on, on Global Thought at Columbia University. She has published a plethora of fantastic books, including <laughs> Expulsions, Brutality and Complexity in the Global Economy, Cities in a World Economy, Losing Control, Sovereignty in an Age of Globalization, A Sociology of Globalization, and The Global City. Her books have been translated into over 20 languages. She is the recipient of a number of awards and mentions, has multiple Doctora Honours Causa, named lectures, and has been selected for various honours lists. She was awarded the Principe de Asturias 2013 prize in the social sciences. She was selected as one of the top 100 women in the sciences in 2018, and she was awarded the Geneva Picciotto prize in 2020. So she's an incredible guest to have. I'm over the moon to have her. Saskia, thank you so much for joining me today. Well, I really enjoyed hearing you talk. <laughs> 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 well, I'd like to ask you, could you just tell us a little bit more about yourself and how you got interested in cities and globalization? Well, it started by me wanting to leave home. I grew up in Buenos Aires mm. and my parents didn't want me to leave. I was 17 years old. I had already done my first year in graduate school, which was a bit young. I, I jumped over. Wow. Mm. And uh, so that gave me a bit of authority vis-a-vis -vis my parents mm. and I said I'm leaving mm. and then I at a very young age of course and and certainly for those times and then I had to pretend for 23 days that was how long the trip was to from Buenos Aires to Hamburg mm. uh, where I had family uh, and I had to pretend that I was traveling with an aunt mm. an aunt who was sufficiently ill oh. that she never showed up, of course. Yeah. She didn't exist. 23 days pretending. I, that was one of the worst <laughs> little bits that I did to myself. Worse than any exam, worse than, you know, continuously. But it prepared me in a way for entering domains where I knew I was at risk. Uh, I was a bit of an adventurer and including with the military in Colombia, you know, I mean, all kinds of stuff. It's just quite, it's quite, when I stand back and look at all the stuff that I did, I can't believe it. But anyhow, it was a learning experience and I held up for 23 days <laughs> pretending mm. I had an aunt with me. Mm. They never found out, so. Fantastic. And that's what sort of that experience you think is what led you to sort of want to look at cities and study globalization. Well, no, no, that that came later. No, it was just a, it was a sort of a sense of I can do this. Mm. I'm interested in 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 discovering, you know, it sort of mm. opened up uh, a broader zone than would be typical for a 17 year old. Mm. It taught me the difficulties, it taught me the, the potentials. So it was, I will never forget that experience, you mm. know? You can imagine. Yes, no, uh, definitely. That must have been very exciting. And then the best part was when we crossed, you know how that is with in, in ships and these, you know, the, mm. the, uh, when you cross the, the, the middle zone, huh? mm. you always have to have a big celebration. Mm. And we were meant to, we, the girls in the, on the ship were meant to sort of, and of course we were meant to have our, our parents there too. And, and it, so it was just an absolute, I had many, many moments where I had to invent this aunt that didn't exist. <laughs> but that did it. I never again was going to lie in that way, you know, because it's a way of lying. It's, it was really hiding, protecting, but you know, so. That was how I wound up from Latin America in Europe. Now, when it comes to sort of your studies in cities and environments, urban environments, yeah. I wanted to ask you about interactive technology and how you think that might play a role with urban streetscapes. Well, the whole question of, of how these 
interactive technologies can be deployed, used, managed, reinvented, added on, et cetera, et cetera, I think is extraordinarily important. Mm -hmm. Now we have certain parts, like in Europe, in most cities, even the poor have access to reasonable connectivity. In the United States, there was a time when the poor did not have access. You know, those who were not poor had access, but you had to pay for it. It was all privatized. That was the problem. And, and nobody was about to bother of the big firms to set it up for poor people. So that struck me enormously. Mm -hmm. So the most that they could do was sort of when you used the telephone, there was an old moment, you were not born then. There was an old moment when, when you, you could sort of via the telephone mm -hmm. create certain connectivities, but it was very cumbersome. And that was all that the poor had access to. The, 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 the United States is so privatized that it would not generate and enable connectivities, you know, which are in a way also very cheap, you know, if a, if a government moves in, I mean, it's not. And that just struck me, that was like another element, you know, that when I confronted these, these things that I hadn't even thought about, both my experience on the ship, this experience and a whole set of other things, I have a whole long list. <laughs> I remember one other time when I was, I was in a very dangerous zone and the only ones who could rescue me were my enemy, the military. Oh, wow. And they were the ones who rescued me. I was in a battle against some military. This was in, in Venezuela, very, very problematic period. Mm -hmm. so, so life for me has the, these elements. I never want to forget these things because it meant that always there was somebody who somehow could see and could enable you, could protect you, you know, that, and it also shows, I mean, these are, I mean, some of these people were rough people, you know, but you could see that even in that context that they could also not be rough, you know, and also be a rescuer. So, so those were always, but that was also part of growing up in Latin America. You know, Latin America is considered one of the most violent areas of the world. Very, very. I mean, we think of the United States. Well, yeah, it's also very violent. But Latin America is very, very brutal. And so if you're doing fine, you're doing great. But if you're not, uh, the indifference, you know, the, I mean, it's just, it's very problematic, really. I mean, there are always good people in everywhere. No, I, one cannot generalize, but you know what I mean. Yes, yes. Now, when it comes to sort of local governance, how do you think cities are going to evolve in order to take care of local areas and make sure people are sort of fully looked after? Right. Well, number one, I am one of those who thinks that we should not simply keep expanding our major cities, you know, mm -hmm. because that means for the elites, they're fine. Everything is in the center, what they need, they live there, etc. But for most of the workers, it can mean two hours, Again, you know, getting up extremely early, then two hours of travel coming in, you arrive at the job already dead tired, you haven't slept enough, and that, that day after day, I mean, I really object to that. So I find um, uh, that quite a few of our major cities should, and, and that is, in Europe, it's okay, you know, except for maybe Paris and, and London, they are very, very big cities, but most of the cities are reasonable. But what you have in, in much of the Americas is really very big cities mm. that whether it's the modest working class that pays the price, you know, mm. the elites are fine. And so to me, this, we have to build new cities. Mm. And when you say that, like in, in some public event or you, you, people are sort of in shock. It's mm. like, well, we have finished with the epoch of building cities, we've built the cities. Mm. We don't need to build cities now. And that's simply incorrect. And I'm talking not just about a country like Africa, a continent like Africa, who may, you know, that may have a lot of people who, whether, who could build cities, who would want to build cities. Uh, but in general, I think like some of, the, some of the cities that the United States has, they're far too big. Mm. It should just, it shouldn't be that way. I mean, look and at Los Angeles. I repeat, you know, the issue is that, that the, the elites don't even notice 
mm-hmm. but it is the workers who have to travel endlessly long. And that, that is the point here for me. And when you're looking at the workers and those distances they have to travel, how do you think cities could change to adapt that commute so people aren't being choked by pollution? Or yeah. sort of well, that, that's expecting them? Exactly. Well, mm-hmm. the, the, the quality of the air, the health factor, the not sleeping enough, you know, all of that. I mean, that is really very, very problematic. Mm-hmm. No, I think the big challenge lies in, in how do we stop expanding our cities because that's in many ways the cheapest way or you need more uh, housing for the workers so they are now at the edge you know so they have to travel for an hour or two hours you know hey that is easy for the for the leaderships so to speak that is of course the problem Mm. and but the interesting point is there was a time when building cities that goes back a very long time that when Mm. building cities was just something that was done Mm. Nowadays, we do not think, oh, let's go build a city. I mean, it's just, you know, we, we assume that we have cities and that's that. And so this notion of building new cities, whenever I bring that up, you know, and I give a lecture or something, people like saying, building new cities, like, I mean, what does that really mean? And that is also a big good question. What would it mean mm. to build cities today? Because they would be different from how we have built them. But, you know, it is quite, to me, it's quite striking. And so I use it almost sometimes as a provocation mm. that this notion of building city, a new city is, I mean, we have done that, we have seen that in the Emirates, of course, huh? in certain mm. parts of the world where you have a lot of wealth and you had very small populations and, and they didn't have cities really. That, that's where it's happening. Mm. But, uh, our countries, our, our, you know, the West, I think some cities are simply too big. And also it's interesting, especially in the UK, how we have so many big cities that are sprawling out, but we also have a housing crisis. Yeah. We have people unable to get into housing and it's because these sort of cities are moving out and pricing up and up, when actually if we built a new city elsewhere, creates a whole new economy, people would actually be able to afford that, to live there, yeah without yeah. driving two hours to get to work. Exactly, exactly. So that, that's, that's the point. Precisely mm. that, why, why do this? And again, I repeat, my sense is, I don't know that for a fact, eh? mm. but my sense is that the, the, those who are well off, who live in the center of the city, don't even think very much about mm. the fact that the people they employ or the cleaners or whatever, that they have to, you know, get up at an ungodly time. They also have families. They, they don't sleep enough night after night. You know, there are all these other factors in play that, that we should just pay more attention to. I think that is beginning to happen. I think the new generations mm. are far more aware of mm. also the question of health huh? yeah. or an, and, and uh, the preference for walking rather than having a car. Mm. You know, there are many positive elements that these new, you are part of that. <laughs> I don't drive. Generation, what? I've never learned to drive. I use public transport or I walk. Yeah, right, exactly. London. Yeah. I am simply not interested in owning a car, for instance, because it's such a hassle. If I need a car, mm. I have a car service, you know. Mm. But, but, uh, but um, I mean, I think Europe has found ways of handling that. Say, a country like the Netherlands, you know, where biking is the... Those, to me, are reasonable I happen to be Dutch, but this is not, I'm not a nationalist Dutch. Mm. So my singing the praises of the Netherlands has nothing to do with it. <laughs> but I really think they, it's a kind of intelligence. It's a practical intelligence mm. that is in play. Huh? And not this, I mean, what you have in the Americas, it's really all the Americas, mm. you know, is, is a, a voracious building industry mm. that can get by with murder. You know, you don't quite have that in Europe, for instance. You don't have that in Seoul or in Japan. There are really limits. You have that in a bunch of other countries as well, you know, where the, the, the ones who are the builders, they just take, and we're not talking modest builders, we're talking very rich enterprises. They simply have too much power in too many cities, not in all cities, but in too many. Mm. And you get buildings that are sort of just quickly put up. They're not really thought about their environmental impacts, the impact on the people. 
Do you that think there fun. may be a way we can use technology to create better performing buildings out of these Absolutely. ones that are already there? Absolutely. Mm. 20 years ago, for instance, the Japanese, you know, Japan is a country that is mostly a huge mix of rocks. You have very little green space and it's a huge population. Mm. And they have known how to maximize uh, by developing all kinds of innovations. And really there is a very, I have, I have, a, I have an article where I list some mm. of the innovations that they have found how to work, what materials, mm. how to work with, with rainfall, etc. But really very, the, the one, the part that is most impressive is very, very complex ways of mixing different types of materials that you can do this and that, you know, I mean, really impressive stuff, uh, far more advanced than what you see typically in the United States where a lot of the builders are very elementary builders. Huh? in the sense that they, they, they don't even try to understand what are the new developments, what are the new ways, you know. Whereas if you go to Europe, if, and especially I think Japan and Seoul stand out, how they innovate, what materials they use, materials that, that, are, that are good, you know, that, that are, don't add to the negatives. So it is quite a difference. Now, sooner or later, that will also come, you know, to the rest of the world. But right now, there are a few countries that really stand out, and they have shown us what can be done. No, that is also, that also matters. Yes, certainly. Now, I think the world has never really seen quite an intense period of urbanization. Uh, as we have previously. Do you think this level of urbanization is sustainable on a global level? No, I think frankly that, that we need many more medium-sized cities. The medium-sized city is ideal. The medium-sized city enables also small, say small businesses mm. uh, to have a chance, less competition from the big ones, etc. Uh, so my notion, and, and it's something again, as I said earlier, that people somehow have a hard time you know, thinking about is we have to build new cities. Mm. Building a new city, of course, is a major operation. Mm. Now, it also would mean that you could apply all kinds of new technologies that we have nowadays, how to handle everything. But I, I mean, you see that in the Emirates, you know, in the, the rich Middle Eastern countries, etc., and some parts of Asia, they have, uh, they're way ahead, you know, of the cities that we have in Europe and in the United States, which are older cities, of course. Mm. But we could really do much, much better. And again, at the most elementary level that we should really be doing is not allowing the cities to expand, expand so that you have workers who have to spend two hours uh, traveling, you know, that, that kind of a thing. And I, I don't know, I think the new generations are far readier to use other instruments, including bikes, et cetera, you know, but also to be less interested in, in owning a car. Yes, mm. they want to be able to hire a car mm. on command, but not, why bother with owning it? You know, mm. you have to go clean it, fix it, you need the space. And so that to me is a, that's a healthy development in the sense that Otherwise, these cars are sitting there, you know, they're occupying space, they emit their continuous emissions from all the metal, etc. It's just not good for anybody. So if you can just hail a car, great. I believe there's a city in Brazil called Curitiba. And Curitiba, then they yes. built such a brilliant public transport system. Yeah. I think it's in, there's a bus every 30 seconds. Yeah. So no one uses cars, no one drives, everyone just uses right. their system. But that is an except. Oh God, this telephone doesn't stop ringing. That is an exceptional uh, case. You know, Curitiba was really an experiment mm. that said we can do it another way, mm. and and in fact uh, they did. It has not been replicated as much as one would want. Mm. So clearly, that it, there is a challenge. But it's very important. I'm so glad to hear that you that you know about it because more and more people are forgetting, you know, the younger generations, mm -hmm. my generation, because it was such an impressive event mm -hmm. that, you know, it, we registered it. It was a historic mm -hmm. event when Curitiba is built. But, um, but many, many today don't even know that.
Well, I think some of our audience may not know about Curitiba. Would you be able to just give us a brief summary of what happened there and well, why it's so incredible? Right, right. Well, this was a this was you know a piece of junk. I mean, Brazil had two experiments, right? One was to build the the the, the headquarters for the country in the middle of a very very uh, if you want rough area in the sense that there were there were no buildings etc so they planned it down using extraordinarily smart and brilliant architects famous architects and they built a city a capital city in the middle of nowhere <laughs> and many of the politicians of course they still live in rio and in sao paulo you know those are the two big attractive cities and they have to go to parliament because the parliament is this but the idea the daring idea and and the guy and the, the, the people who were involved also included some brilliant architects etc it, it is sort of an experiment but it's to me again i stand back and i say how rare it is for any country to simply build a city Mm. You know, we, I mean, there was a time when that is what you did, you built cities, but mm. now to us, it seems like, I mean, it's just like almost unimaginable building a city, mm. cities are there, right? And, and so to me, that is sort of an interesting, and I'm waiting for who's the next person who says, when who has the means and the support, uh, you know, let's build. A city. And in that sense, Brazil was an amazing event. And of course, it's a city that nobody likes. It's in the middle of the jungle, you know. Mm. And so it, it was not a success. It was brilliant design, huh? mm. brilliant. But mm. it was not a success in terms of the people. Excellent. Now, the next thing I wanted to ask you was about COVID. Um, it's sort of the big question that's hanging over us right now. Do you right. think it's going to have a big impact on how future cities, if they're built, how they're going to be planned, or even how current cities are going to adapt over the coming years? Well, the first, the first item, I think, is that the leadership of cities, mm. supposedly, will be more careful about identifying something that can affect a population, mm. right? A virus is the, the most familiar format and also something that is invisible and doesn't have smell mm. and makes no sound. You understand? Yeah. That is, that is a, that's major. We can't hear it. We can smell it. Mm. We can't really touch it. Uh, it touches us, however. It smells us. It can kill us. So that that is a kind of... Uh, that's a very extreme situation because we continuously are dealing with viruses. I mean, continuously. And we're dealing with other kinds of you know, illnesses and uh, say dogs that are ill and bite you, whatever. I mean, it's not like we are, but this, this particular sort of the types of viruses that are coming up, uh, it's sort of different. And we already know that what we think of as one virus, the experts already know that it's more than one. You know, it's one that is global, but it has different incarnations. So I think that, and, and the fact that we cannot smell it, we cannot hear it, and before we know it, it can kill us. That's quite a mix, you know, that, that is serious stuff. Now, one take that I have, this is me at my most positive, believe it or not, it doesn't sound positive, but I'm telling you, which is that um, this virus is affecting us. Um, we know it's a new virus, by the way, but still it could be, we have had viruses all the time, but they have not been in our cities. Yes. You know, not so much. Why? Because there were other spaces. Well, we have destroyed enough uh, habitat for all kinds of that now they are also in the city, mm -hmm. and and that to me is is sort of something that we cannot forget and an invitation again as I was saying earlier we have to build new cities we have to build smaller cities cities that are manageable cities that don't require vast endless stretches of cement 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 because that also is a is a killer of modes of life mm -hmm. that that otherwise can help us can enable us right. <clears throat> so for me, 
this is sort of one a key project. Did I answer your question now or not? Or was there something else that you were asking also? No, 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 that's absolutely okay. wonderful. Yes, yes, that's amazing. So, so that is sort of my take that mm -hmm. we really need to build, we need to build cities, mm. which is something that, you know, ages ago, of course we all built, built a city, but today it seems simply unbelievable. I mean, built a city, mm. but the Emirates, again, as I was saying, they are doing that. Now, I know you I mean, they're not desirable cities. I think that they're problematic cities. That's another matter, but... Yes. Now, I know UAE are building cities, but are there any other cities in the emerging or developed worlds that have excelled, in your opinion, in terms of sort of smart city innovation? Well, of course, there are some famous cases, Mazdar and, uh, in the, the, uh, and, and, um, and Seoul, of course, had created mm. it, you know. Those are, but they, they somehow, they didn't work well enough mm. for many other places to try it out. It's also true that those two places are very rich because mm -hmm. it take a vast amount of money. Mm -hmm. We're talking serious cash, as we say in the business. And so, so it will be a while before we build new. So not, right now we built really a new city. And, and that is why we're seeing this massive, this endless expansion, expansion, expansion of cities. I mean, Europe has managed to have formats that prevent that a bit though you know paris by now is huge yes UK, huge i mean you know london and it's what huge so but still it's not like latin america mm. latin america has vast stretches of land unoccupied land available mm. land and so it did have just expanded 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 and they are problematic the same thing with asia with asia you also have you know and my, my question, I come back to it, you know, is when do we really recognize we must build new cities? When I talk to people about building new cities, they look at me like saying, building a new city? It's like you build a building. You don't build a new city. You know, that is sort of something that is still, but we'll get there. Yes. Now, my next question, I think I might know the answer. Um, but if you could make one thing happen in the next 12 months, what would it be? In the next 12 months? Mm. Well, look, inevitably, for me, it would be connected to that which is the most aggressive mm. element and regarding those who are least able to contest and protect themselves from that. So it is about the virus that we have. Mm. And the virus we know, we now have a, a new version is emergent and it is even stronger than the old one. Yes. And again, the notion that it is silent, has no smell, but can access us, you know, through various orifices, etc. It's a combination that you could create a film that would be rather terrifying. We humans, we, we have been very good, I would say, in avoiding terror, mm. you know? We really, I mean, we could be terrorized by all kinds of things, mm. but we're not. Now, it, that's partly a form of ignorance, that's partly laziness, that's partly uh, that we don't see it, we don't smell it, we don't hear it, so, you know, why bother? All kinds of things, but it is quite, you know, to me it is sort of an, ooh, it is a sort of an interesting point uh, in, in many ways. Well, I think we've lived quite comfortably for a period of time. Um, since World War II ended, actually, we've seen great affluence. We've seen uh, peace for the most part. We have had wars going on, but they've never had that same sort of feel on public consciousness. So I think that sense of security has sort of backfired on us when actually we've been faced with something that that's a very good to react. That's a very good point. That's a very good point. We, you know, what is quite extraordinary, even now with the pandemic, you know, mm -hmm. is is how easy it is for us if we are not directly affected or we have somebody who's close to us, mm -hmm. how we can continue to live our lives with great risks surrounding us. Now, I think Mother Nature knew what she was doing. That's sort of my take in the sense that if we would, with our intelligence and our awareness and our capacity to notice and to see, if we would also be 
completely sort of adjusting to sounds about threatening elements, we would all be super neurotic. Now we are just modest neurotic, but in that case, we would just be, it would be unbearable, you mm. know, and we would wind up probably killing each other because it would just be, we couldn't handle it. Mm. So there is something about, and it must have been also a, a long history of adjustment of us humans. You know, we know that we have a long history huh, of, mm. and, and so we wind up rather, I think I'm when I when all is said and done, I'm rather impressed with what Mother Nature produced here in terms of us, in the sense that we are not terrified by everything, that that if that we could know, but simply don't even care to know, which sort of protects us from being afraid of this and afraid of that. And of course, it breaks down a bit. This is like a little interruption here of the analysis. It breaks a bit when you have a baby because then everything, you know, you are aware of the risk and of the dirt and of the that and of the, you know, but, but pretty soon when that baby is two years old, you have already forgotten about all the possible threats in any house, in any shop, on the street, in a bus, you know, in a car. Uh, so, so we are in a way sturdy mm. and far less sensitive mm. than we could be. And of course, we have some people who are very sensitive, but we're sensitive to certain things, mm. you know, which makes us human in a way. But we're also insensitive to all these microbes, like all this invisible stuff that could really be uh, trouble. And one question I think that we must ask ourselves, and I don't have a full answer, is mm. how bad is it in very poor neighborhoods? We know that it is bad, you know, we know about Brazil, we know about all kinds of, but say in, in our American cities, are you, where are you? Are you in, I'm of course in London right now, you are in? I'm in London as well. In London. But cities like London and New York, you know, they, there's all kinds of stuff that, that probably at the edges and, and if you're in very poor neighborhoods and sort of semi-destroyed, you know, unhealthy water bodies, et cetera, et cetera. But with it all, our cities in the West have, have uh, helped us. I think they have been a positive in many ways. Huh? <clears throat> in Latin America, it's more difficult to, to assert that, that they have been a positive. And similarly, I would say for, for parts of, the, of North America, the Europeans have just had a different mode of building and of making the urban condition. And it has been to our advantage that they did that. You know, uh, and I think that 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 helps. Mm. No, definitely. I, I, I agree as well. And I think in the US, you have so many different issues with sort of how they built up suburbs outside of the cities. You, of course, have segregation and Jim Crow and how that affected cities and poorer communities being distributed. Yeah. Um, it's and very people, difficult now. And exactly. And how many people don't have access to medical services? You understand that? Yeah. But half of the population doesn't have. Mm. This is something that in 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 the in the in Europe you have. Mm. You know, even if you're poor, you are entitled to have access to hospital. Not in the United States. I mean, it has to be a very special little group of doctors who decide, okay, we're going to help the poor. Mm. But otherwise, the poor are out. I mean, it, it's quite it, it's absolutely shocking. You know, it it really is is very bad. The U.S. is is the United States is pretty brutal. I mean, Argentina was better with the poor than 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 and poorer country than 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 say New York. But uh, so now looking to the future, what do you think cities are going to be like in twenty to thirty years? If you could skip ahead to London in twenty forty, what do you think it will be like? Right. Well, I think if it remains the sort of the rich city that it is. Uh, in other words, with all kinds of resources, mm. uh, with a strong presence of very smart people in it that can also make a difference for how the city functions, you know, the quality of air and all of that. You know, if we have all of that in play still, it will be okay. Mm. The question is, you know, will we have everything in play? Mm. Now, I think that Europe, is much better prepared. Maybe it's its long history. You understand that Europe mm -hmm. 
the continent and, and I mean also, also the UK. These are countries with long histories where all kinds of intelligent actors have generated innovations, have designed systems for everything, you know, and some of these systems decay and then they're replaced by newer ones and better. But, but you know, basically an active uh, sort of mode of keeping those cities alive, making them better, making them healthy. You know, this is very positive. Nothing is perfect here. Okay? It's highly imperfect. Mm. But Comem had, there is a lot of that. When you look at, at some of the, the newer cities, like in the Americas, you just, it's a bit different. I mean, you have a mix, you know, you have some great spaces, etc. But for instance, the medical, just, just to go back to the medical system, the medical system, you know, takes care of about 50% of the population and the rest is a bit out. Uh, we have a lot of homeless. You also have that now in London. Uh, so, but with it all, I think that the fact that we have the cities that we have is very good. It's very important. And we should protect them. We should, we should repair them. We should. Because I do think that a time will come when, when there won't be enough land that is, that is available either for whatever reasons to, to keep expanding very much. And I, I, one can imagine some negative scenarios in terms of, of what it is for low-income people. We get a hint of that when we look at certain very crowded zones in, 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 you know, in other parts of the world where people are really suffering. The poor are getting poorer and there are more poor. And India for me is exhibit number one. So much intelligence. I mean, India has so many. Your average poor, low-income worker has a stronger intelligence than the average American. I mean, they are, they just have from, since they were very little, it's a kind of intelligence. It really is to me very admirable and special that you don't see in, in the Americas, you know, in, that, that's poor people can have this active intelligence. That is what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but I think that, that, um, that India is going to be headed into massive problems. We already now know, you, we know that, you know that, that there are quite a few places that no longer have water. The water has to be trucked in. Well, that is, and it, it, it means also poor people, of course. That's bad news. So that is very bad news. Compare that to the Americas. The Americas have vast amounts of space, vast amounts of resources. And the Europeans have complex systems in play that will ensure that they will have all what they need. And the Europeans, to me, and, and also in some ways the Chinese, huh? China is very, very, uh, also very smart how they are doing it. Uh, but it still leaves a lot of ground, you know, where it will be problematic. I don't know. I think that, I think that, I think that we will have some, some very major challenges. And I hope that there will be enough smart people and generous souls, you know, that kind of person that, that we can make it better because otherwise, you know, you, the, the elites and the privileged and those who have reasonable incomes and those who have a life also in university. I mean, we're all fine. Mm. Zero complaint, frankly. But I, I, what are we, half of the population, say, in the Americas? Or are we maybe, we are not two thirds of it. Mm. We are half or less than half. And that, of course, is problematic. And you don't see any move to recognize that the concentration of wealth at the top is just partly also an extracting of the little things, the little gains that the battalions of poor low income workers have. You know, we keep extracting, extracting it, all this concentrating at the top and the top is not the 1%, the top is 20%, you know? So that's a very big top that grabs, grabs, grabs. And, um, we have a problem. I mean, that is this, this greed, this notion that the more you, the richer you are, the better. It's a killer. Mm -hmm. 
you know, it's just, I mean, it's a killer in many ways. It, it, it kills it's part of the sociability of the city, part of the fun of the city, because you just extract, extract. You don't, you don't enable like the street artists or the little shops or the whatever, you know, that is also part of a sort of nice to have. Uh, so, so those are issues. Those are all issues. And, and we are not, we're not doing much to address it. Europe, again, Europe is set up. I mean, it's existed for millennia, Europe you know, mm. as built environments. Mm. They are, they have just a, they have a better, they have a better infrastructure at that level, at the level of how the cities were designed. I don't mean just the water pipes, you know, but I mean how the cities were designed. And, and, and there was a lot of poverty there and there was a lot of illness, huh? Mm. But they, they, um, they, in the end, they have a better concept, I think, mm. than, uh, than we have in the America. The Americas are pretty brutal in many ways. I don't know. You are English, right, or not? Yes, but I've lived in the US. I lived in San Diego for a bit. Well, San Diego is very neat and proper. Mm. Yes, although I was just outside, so it was very difficult to sort of get around because yeah. if you didn't have a car, there was no public transport. Oh yeah, without car, you are really, uh, yeah, that's true. Yes. So that was difficult. But otherwise, no, it was a very beautiful city. I did enjoy being there. Yeah. And it's yeah. always nice to be on the coast. Yeah, 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 yeah. So my last question that I really wanted to ask you today was, do you think technology will have the greatest impact on future city planning or will people still shape cities? Well, I think technology is a very significant actor and we have actually very, very desirable technologies. And then we have technologies that are not desirable. Huh? We cannot romanticize. Mm. I think that the marriage of the technology with, with smart uh, users mm. is very important. You, you know, you can have great technology, but if it gets connected to people who only want to grab something or be sort of the extraction mode rather than the the constitutive mode, you know, that is a differentiation that I would make. If you have actors, tools, instruments, technologies that can be constitutive of something, of a, of a, of a better way to do this, of an expanded that, of a facilitating those who are now homeless to have a reasonable sort of whatever, you know, ways of living, you know, th that's all great. But, but it also, it, it, it always, in the end, it still depends also on us. Now, the question of poverty is emerging as a major issue. I think you are probably aware of that. In also in rich cities, it used to be that, you know, poverty was for poor countries and hell no, uh, poverty is very much. So how, when are we really going to start seriously building for, you know, all kinds of housing and, and hospitals, etc that can serve also low-income people because half of our population uh, is rich uh, in the West. And some of it, which is not, and, and then there are some that are truly very, very poor, uh, you know, but really the middle classes have split into two classes, one that is getting poorer and the other one is getting richer. So we have, a, we have a growth of a rich class that in a city like New York, I think they are like 40%, you know? Uh, and, and, and some of it is, it's an advantage also to the lower income classes because it gives them jobs, but it also means the issue also has become, so in a city like New York, the issue is that, that the shops that sell food, et cetera, they are now, they have enough high income clients that they have raised the prices. So the poor are doubly affected. It's not just that they are poor, that they lost their jobs, that they, but it's also that food, just buying food is a challenge because it has become more expensive. Huh? So, so this is something, and, and I think of the political classes and I wonder, is there any way in which they can somehow, at least some of them, you know, take this seriously and say, look, we must do something mm. to enable people who work in our firms, in our factories, in our theaters, in our etc., that they have reasonable lives and they, that they have access to housing that is not, you know, to our drive or to our whatever bus and train. So, so there is stuff like that. 
do I think that this will, will take place anytime soon? Not really, but there is a possibility mm. that there is a kind of recognition, you know, also because we have new generations coming in, mm. uh, that, that, that say, you know, we don't need to be this brutal with the mm. poor, you know? Mm. We don't, it, it's not even, even if you have people who don't want to give money, but recognize that it's also to my advantage that those workers that I have don't have to travel two hours, mm. right? That kind of stuff. So we're very, very close to the ground. I think we're at that level right now. Mm. This is not the moment to discuss what is the most complex and beautiful kind of tower that we can build. They are doing that too, by the way. Uh, the moment really here is how do we make it a bit better for the 50% to 60% of the population in our big cities, the big cities are, you know, smaller cities are another story, in the big cities that we depend on. Mm. And we should enable them to have, uh, to, to be healthier, you know, to be able mm. to sleep, to be able, not, not do what is happening now. So, mm. so that is sort of, you know, an, a, a bit of the story as well. Well, that's what I found really interesting over the last few months, really how space in London alone has started to change. Office blocks are now empty. They're being turned into housing. More people are working from home. Businesses are choosing not to have office space. Exactly. So actually, that space is now suddenly, we've got big parts of the city that are unoccupied. Yeah. And then suddenly I think London is going to just change. And I'm sure not just London, but other cities are going to really change how they use space and what space is for. Yeah, absolutely. No, this is this is a very important point, and and we are all sort of delighting in this notion, you know, that that the, that the housing question changes, that there will be empty housing, hence there will be an interest in in enabling, you know, sort of modest middle classes, etc., to enable them to get into those houses. Now, I think that all of that is very important, and I also think that this notion that uh, a lack of interest in owning a car mm -hmm. is going to make a big difference, you know, in terms of air quality in terms of traffic and and just create a, a more even field between those who own cars and those who don't own cars you know mm -hmm. that owning a car and i see that with my students they have zero interest in owning a car they mm -hmm. want access to a car but they don't want to deal with fixing the car with bringing it to the shop you know to get it repaired none of that they just want a mode of transport that works and i think that is sort of a healthy you know, a healthy reaction, but really the just just to to um, to leave that on the platform here. Uh, I do think that the inequality issue, uh, you know, inequality is partly you could say, well, it's sort of it's built in. It is indeed, but then there is another part mm -hmm. that that and and I can see that we have a, we have a. We have a new generation of very rich young people yeah. who mostly got it through their parents yeah. who really are indifferent to, you know, to social injustice, to inequality, to suffering. That is to me alarming. We have a, you know, half of the new generations, they are wonderful, they're totally, you know, like one would want them. And then there is the other half that is pretty selfish and it's like they have learned something from the system that tells them, you know, you're either going to be rather poorish and the rents will keep increasing and no, I don't want to be that. I want to have money, mm -hmm. you know, et cetera. Rather than sort of a more even field that a mix of a certain, we used to have a kind of a middle class that was neither very rich nor was it poor, mm. you know, but that was the main, sort of the main type of population. And that is a bit gone. It, it is more a split. And, and I think I find that very, very problematic. This growth of, I mean, we're talking about 20 to 30% of very, very rich people living in our major cities. They can grab a vast amount of space in that city. They shape the way the restaurants will produce their, their menus and what they will charge. So they have created, I mean, we now all speak about, oh my God, everything is so expensive. Well, yes, that is partly the effect when you have 50% very high income and the other 
uh, with various variations, of course, in that 50%, but still. And then the other part is just losing ground, getting poorer. And that, that, is, a, that is a massive shadow effect on the whole city. And there are the winners and then there are the losers. And the losers part, why? It shouldn't be that way. You know, it just shouldn't. How you get to that, I don't know. And believe me, London is still better than New York <laughs> mm. <laughs> or yeah. any of the big American cities. So mm. it's very difficult because actually it's about sharing. It's about realizing as human beings, we do all need to work with each other. We will all need things from other human beings. Exactly, we do. Selfish. Yeah. That's when actually things will get more expensive. Things will get more difficult yeah. for everyone. Yeah, yeah, mm. yeah. Well, thank you so much, Saskia, for coming along to today's session. It's been a joy having you. I've learned absolute bucket loads. It's been a really incredible session. Um, and I'm sure everyone watching has really enjoyed it as well. So thank you. Now, for everyone watching, next week will be our final week of our 12-week webinar series. Uh, it's very odd that we finally, we've finally we made it to the end. Um, I've really enjoyed this series. I think it's been incredible. We've had so many exciting guests. Um, and then next week on Friday will be our final session, and that will be the big debate. Um, so do make sure to come, to, uh, come along to that. It's going to be really cool. Um, now, if you want to catch up on any of our previous sessions, we're also going to be making all of the sessions that we've done for this series available online as well. Uh, so we'll be sending out some email information about that as well at the end of this series. Uh, so thank you so much. As usual, do please stay safe and stay healthy out there and have a really wonderful weekend. Until next time, keep it 360, everyone. Bye.